edition of AB to Z. I'm Joe Murphy. And I'm Tyler St. Lawrence. Here's what's happening around the active Boxborough community. Like so many Americans, Acton Boxborough Regional High School was deeply impacted by the recent tragedy that took place in Newtown, Connecticut. The senseless killing of 20 elementary school students and six staff members has left some students here shaken and asking questions. We asked school principal Dr. Alix Callen what the school has done to help students cope with the difficult situation. Friday afternoon, I, um, I first emailed the staff once I'd found out what happened, um, and then emailed parents that afternoon um, to let them know that there were a few things we were doing. One was that we would have counselors available on Monday. I met with the counselors on Friday afternoon to make sure um, that they would be all set on, on Monday. And uh, Mr. Chico, the department leader, has done an amazing job of, of, of making sure that counselors are ready and prepared to, to help any students who are struggling. Um, I stayed in touch over the weekend with parents and with and with teachers, you know, checking in, making sure that they were doing okay, sending out resources about how to talk to students, what were things that they could do that would would help student help people feel better. Um, and uh, then Sunday, I got some had a nice back and forth email exchange with some of our student leaders about. Um, how, how we would respond on Monday and, and we shared stories that we had heard about students choosing to wear green, students around the country and I, I guess initially at Newtown High School choosing to wear green and white um, in recognition of students at Sandy Hook and so I noticed that a number of students did that yesterday and was really touched by, by our students' willingness to, to, um, to sort of reach out and to do something symbolically to, to support the families um, and school community in Newtown. We will have more on this story and how this event may impact AB in the long run after the school vacation. In the meantime, all of us here at ABRHS send our thoughts and best wishes to the families impacted by this tragic event. In other news, there are some new environmentally friendly water fountains at the school this year. These devices are, both, are to both cut down on the use of plastic bottles and to help ensure clean filtered water for students and staff. With more on the story, here's Robert Trebachinik. A new eco-friendly initiative here at AB are these new water fountains that eliminate the need for water bottles. Disposable water bottles, that is. Students and faculty can now put their refillable water bottles under the designated nozzle and later enjoy clean, green, cold, and local fresh spring water. I asked Rebecca Kane how she felt about the water fountains. It makes it easier to fill up your reusable water bottle and you don't have to waste a bunch of plastic ones. There are many similarities and differences between the new and the old water fountains, but many of the differences are. New meters that indicate how much waste we have eliminated from the planet by decreasing disposable water bottle count. There are also new special filters that purify our fresh water. I talked to Nancy Harder on her take on the new water fountains. Well, I've enjoyed reusing my water bottles. I don't feel like I'm wasting as much as I used to before the water fountains were here. I also enjoy that it's being filtered. I also enjoy the countdown that it gives you. It feels like you're contributing to keeping the world cleaner. I asked Estaki about how he felt about the new water fountains. You finish this water and you can just like refill it up. You know, it's very simple, very simple task to do. So it, it helps you out. You know, you're, you're like up there playing basketball, you know, working out all the time. Just go in, fill it up. This is Robert Tabachnik reporting for A, B to Z. Over the past 13 months, many of you have probably seen the signs throughout Acton and surrounding communities help bring Bridget home. Bridget is a husky who escaped from her yard in Littleton in November 2011. And over a year later, Bridget's owner, Pat Panic, is not giving up hope. She believes her dog is still alive and she's determined to find her. Recently, Pat sat down and spoke with our own Tom O'Hara. Here's an exclusive interview. I'm here with Pat Panic, owner of the dog Bridget, who has been missing for some time now. Pat, can you tell us about your dog? Yeah, uh, my dog was a rescue um, from down south where she lived for almost six years as um, what they call a puppy mill mama. She was breeding stock for a puppy mill. And when they were done with her, they turned her into a high kill shelter where she was rescued by a group and brought up here so that I could have her. And um, I fell in love with her the first time I saw her picture, actually. So um, she was with me for a little more than seven months when she got a wild hair, decided that instead of just doing her business outside at midnight for the last time, she would dig an itty bitty little hole 
I'm, you would not think a dog that size could get through a hole that was no bigger than this. But she did. And she left all sorts of hair behind, and she was so proud of herself when we saw her. So I got my other dog, and we walked down the street, and there she is at the corner on the common, and just all proud and all puffed up, and let's play was kind of what she was saying. But then she got spooked uh, by a noise, and, she, and my, do my dog that I had backed out of his collar and thank God ran home, but she took off in the other direction, and that was a year and two days ago. All right, so how many sightings have been reported and how often did they come in? That's a, an interesting question. In the beginning, we had 30 sightings pretty rapidly, but it's hard to know because Huskies are escape artists and there are other Huskies in Acton that escape. So it's hard to always know if it's her. And then we went through a real dry spell of almost six months where we heard absolutely nothing. And I was starting to think, well, I've, I've got to make a decision. The year is coming up. I've got to make a decision. Am I going to continue with this? And um, then on my birthday, the only thing that I wished for was a sighting of Bridget, which she was nice enough at 5.45 p.m. to provide. So we got the tracking dogs up, mm -hmm. and they confirmed that it was indeed Bridget. And we've had several sightings, five or six sightings since then. So, so when was the most recent sighting? Thanksgiving morning. Wow. So we understand there were some obstacles you, uh, when you tried to put up signs around town. Uh, yeah. Um, have you solved these problems, and can you put up any more signs? Well, now that's a trick <laughs> question. Um, CBS came out because somebody mm -hmm. told them about the problem I was having with the signs here in Acton. Uh, I've spent now over $10,000 in signs because wow. it's been proven that 98% of the dogs that eventually come home, it's because of signage. So anyway, one of your selectmen here in town decided that after three months, my dog was most likely dead. But uh, he got a lot of flack for his attitude. Mm -hmm. So um, he came back through the you know, back doors or behind the scenes and said that I could, as long as I left them up only for a reasonable time uh, and dated them, I could, I could put them up. That has not transpired. Every mm. time I put up signs within 48 hours, they're all down. And sometimes mm. we're talking 250 signs because I put so many up because I'm hoping that they'll miss a couple. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. They're, they're really thorough. Mm -hmm. So we've heard about some possible new leads in a dog searching team that has come in. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, I've been um, in April um, because I, there were so many Huskies around. I needed to know which sightings were my dog, so I contacted Karen Tarquin, <coughs> who is the Animal Planet's pet detective, and she has a business called Lost Pet Professionals. So she and a couple of her trainees came up, and um, she told me, she says, not all of these sightings can be Bridget. Well, every mm. single one of them that she checked out was Bridget. Wow. So we were able to know what area to focus the signage in mm. instead of spreading it all over Maynard, Stowe, Concord, Foxborough, we kind of knew where she was. Mm -hmm. And she's still kind of in that area. Yeah. So what leads you to believe that Bridget is still out there? Uh, because people have seen her? Yeah. How long will you keep looking? Until I have a body or mm -hmm. a collar or I know that she's too old to have survived. Mm -hmm. She's going to turn eight in just uh, three days. So she's got a little life left in her, yeah. but she's kind of skinny and dirty now, I hear, <laughs> I'm told, but not a surprise. Mm -hmm. Is there anything people can do now to help your cause? Leave my signs up. <laughs> 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 Number one, uh, call um, me as soon as you see her or you even think you see her. It doesn't even matter if you're not mm -hmm. sure. It's important to have a timely sightings call so that we can get somebody out there. Probably we aren't going to see her, but at least we can get information about exactly where. So if I need to bring the tracking dogs back, they know where to start to see mm -hmm. if it's her or not. So. That would really help and just talk about her, um, let people know that she is skinny and dirty and described as filthy and mangy and very thin mm. and um, looking a little distressed. So she doesn't look like that picture mm. or that picture. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't look like that anymore. She's uh, kind of matted and you can't mm. see the mar her markings that well and she's dirty and All skinny. Right. Yeah, well thanks for joining us, Pat, and we hope that you find Bridget. Thank you, Tom. Beginning in the fall of 2014, there could be a major change in our two communities. 
There is a proposal on the table to regionalize the Acton and Bothell School Districts in grades K through 12. But this plan still has some major hurdles to get over. Recently, our own Andrew Curran sat down with Acton and Boxmore Regional School District Superintendent, Dr. Stephen Mills, to talk more about the proposal. Superintendent of Schools, talking about regionalization of Boxborough with Acton. Dr. Mills, how did the idea of regionalization first come about and how do you support it? Sure, yes, thank you. First of all, it's great to be on your show again. Um, actually, it's been explored, it was like 15 years ago, I believe. There was some interest in looking at uh, regionalizing K to 12. As you know, we're currently regionalized 7 to 12, the junior high and the high school. Uh, but uh, up until now, at least, the governmental structures are such that Boxborough has its own elementary school, its own superintendent, its own school committee. Uh, and then they, they join the region when the kids get to the junior high and seventh grade. Um, I think more recently, in the past year or two, there's been a lot of interest, uh, particularly from Boxborough, because they have a demographic issue where they have a decreasing enrollment over the next five or ten years. So they're really in a position they have to do something. They really need to either regionalize K to 12 with Acton, uh, or if they don't do that, uh, they'll, uh, they'll probably accept a lot more school choice students in, which we here at this regional level would get anyway eventually. So either way, there's going to be an impact for uh, the current Acton Boxborough Regional School District. Uh, do I support it? Yes, I do. Uh, and I, I fully respect that people disagree about the subjects. Some people support it, others not so much. Uh, but one of, the, uh, one of the criticisms of government, local, state, and federal, is that it's inefficient. There's a uh, duplication of services, things of that nature. Uh, there's a lot of that here. Uh, I have, for instance, I have uh, two payroll departments, one for Acton Public and one for Acton Boxborough Regional. Uh, a purchasing department all within the business office uh, and then Boxborough has its own so really there's three right now there's three different payroll offices purchasing offices things of that nature that is just duplicative it's inefficient you know we could regionalize and become one system where we just need uh, one of those things so there's a potential for quite a bit of uh, cost savings uh, the, the, uh, the study committee is talking about maybe six or seven hundred thousand dollars a year uh, and I, I certainly agree with that uh, so I think it, from my perspective it makes eminent sense uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful uh, April 29th, actually, there's going to be two simultaneous town meetings, one here in Acton, one in Boxborough, um, and the, two, the, the, the people of the, of the two towns will eventually decide this uh, on uh, April 29th. So how will the system work, and uh, will kids from both schools immediately have, ha have access to all the schools or both towns? Yeah, uh, the very short answer to that question is yes. Uh, however, you know, there is already a process in, in my office for the five Acton uh, schools, where there is school choice, we tremendously value school choice here in Acton. I see nothing but even in improving the opportunities for choice if Blanche joins the five uh, Acton elementary schools. Uh, but uh, people are pretty much tied in and dug into their, their schools. There's a tremendous pride in each of the five elementary schools in Acton, certainly a lot of pride in, in the Blanche elementary school. So I don't think you're going to be seeing people running off to some other school immediately. But yes, in, in short, they'll have the opportunity to if they would like to do that. Yeah. Uh, what do you see as the benefits of uh, regionalization, and um, would it save the town money? Or yes, uh, as I mentioned just before, there's a lot of duplication uh, currently. Uh, we could reduce the superintendent position, a business manager position, a special ed director position. Those positions are required if you have your own school district. Boxborough currently has its own separate school district, so those things uh, are necessary. Just as I said, if you according to state law, if you're going to have a district, but there's not. Um, in addition to the kinds of things I mentioned just a few minutes ago about duplication, uh, this might sound very boring to the average person out there, but it's my, it's my life. We have no less than 110 reports were required by law every year to submit to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education because of accountability, and, and, and I'm fine with that. The problem is, in my office, I have to do it twice, Acton Public School System, then Acton Boxville Regional School System. Curtis Bates, the superintendent over in Boxville, has to do it over there just for that one school. It's ridiculous, it's, it's silliness. If we could do, instead of doing those, you know, each of those 110 reports three times, if we could do them just once a year, that would free up a lot of my staff to do more direct service work with teachers and, 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 and uh, principals. So, yeah, I see a huge advantage to uh, regionalizing. Um, it'll save, again, the, the current uh, estimates are somewhere around six to $700,000 a year. Uh, would parents still have the school choice option, and would elementary schools still have their own identities? Yeah, absolutely, Andrew. That's, uh, I'm almost surprised at the concern that I'm he hearing about that, that somehow things would change and things would be uniform everywhere. This is a great school system. I don't, I don't, I'm not bragging. I don't like to take personal credit for it, but what has made Acton the great school system that it is is its choice, the fact that the schools are, by design, very different from each other. The two schools 
under the Packard Damon roof, those schools are very different in terms of philosophy, the way they approach education, the way they teach children, the way they assess student progress. Then you might see it a more traditional elementary school like the Conan School or the Douglas School. And that's fine. That's great. And parents can choose that. Blanchard would offer yet a sixth choice for acting parents. Rather than five choices, you have, you have six. Uh, uh, the Barksboro residents obviously have a huge advantage. They, they have no choice right now other than the one school, which they love and they're very proud of. But uh, if they pre uh, prefer to program over in, uh, in acting, they could avail themselves of that. So, no. I mean, as long as I'm superintendent, school choice is what this community is about. We value it. It, it, it defines who we are. And I would do nothing to in, ever discourage that. And I see this, as I just said, as, as an opportunity really for uh, increased choice rather than choice of five to be a choice of six. The, uh, the Blanchard Elementary School has an outstanding uh, elementary um, uh, instrumental music program. Uh, frankly, better than, the, than what we have uh, in, in the five acting elementary schools. So if there was an acting family that very, very much valued uh, music and instrumental instruction for their children, they could choose Blanchard. You know, I, think that's, I think that's great. You know? So no, I see the choice opportunities expanding with this regionalization. And I have never said anything in any way that would uh, discourage uh, uniqueness. You know? I think, understandably, if you live in the town of Barksville, I think people are concerned that the Blanchard Elementary School is going to get swallowed up into this larger system. But uh, it doesn't happen now in Acton. Each of the five elementary schools are very different from each other. And I would continue that with the Blanchard School. Um, so would, this, would, this, would you be the, still be the superintendent of both communities? And uh, are you concerned with having that much work? Uh, <laughs> my last job, I was the deputy superintendent of Worcester Public Schools. Worcester is the second largest school district in, in, in New England. I had 43 <laughs> elementary schools. So no, I'm not <laughs> concerned about going from five elementary schools to six elementary schools. I need the corresponding staff support, which I think that I would have, but no, I'm not at all concerned about that. And I believe without violating any confidences of, of uh, Curtis Bates, the superintendent over there, uh, we, we joked at one public meeting that would arm wrestle over who gets the job, but he and I both know for private reasons there's going to be no need for any arm wrestle. If, if there is to be a regionalization, then I'll be the superintendent of the six elementary school. So um, where is the process right now, and uh, do you know when a final decision will be made? Yes. Uh, so there's uh, a study committee of ten, uh, really 12 people. There's 10 people, five citizens of Acton, five citizens of, of Boxborough. Uh, Curtis Bates, the superintendent there in Boxborough, and myself are additional ex officio members. We don't vote on it. It's really the townspeople's representatives. Uh, that's been going on for about a year and a half now. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, there's a meeting this evening at the Blanchard School, a meeting at 5.30 this evening, working through all the kind of logistical details of how this would work. Uh, so that study committee has formulated a document that's now out there in the public uh, for all townspeople in both communities to review and to look at and to take apart and criticize, et cetera. Uh, there's been a number of public forums already. Representatives from that study committee have gone around, for instance, to the various PTO groups, uh, parent teachers, student organization groups. Uh, there's been a couple meetings in the Acton Town Hall uh, that actually have been really prominently attended. The League of Women Voters uh, has had one forum. So right now, the study committee is kind of trying to educate and inform, I should say, the larger communities about what this is about and how it'll come to be. Uh, they'll finalize that document after they get all this community input over the next couple of months. And uh, again, I keep repeating, I say this at every meeting I go to, please circle on your calendars April 29th. It's a Monday evening. Uh, if there are two special town meetings, these are in addition to the regular annual town meetings. Acton has its regular town meeting, I think it's uh, April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. So about a month after that, on uh, Monday night, there will be a special town meeting uh, here, in, uh, here in the high school auditorium for the residents of Acton. Uh, Peter Ashton, I believe, will present uh, the recommendation of the committee. And that's at exactly the same time and hour and date. Uh, over at the Blanchard School will be a special town meeting in Boxborough where Vince Amoruso, a uh, Boxborough resident and longtime member of this committee, he will present the, you know, the proposition to the townspeople of Boxborough. And they'll both vote on it that same night. And both towns have to vote a majority vote. Uh, and if that happens, we, we move forward with, with the regionalization. It will still take, I need to point out, it'll still take another year of planning, even if the uh, two town meetings approve it. It wouldn't start for next school year. It would start July of 2014, be another year out after this, after next year. Um, if it is approved, when would the regionalization start, or yeah. officially? Yeah, it's officially it would start on July. For, see, governments go by fiscal year. You know, a calendar year is July, uh, January 1 to December 31st. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, government, local, state, and federal government operate on a fiscal year. That's July 1 through the following June 30th. Uh, so. Uh, it would go into effect on July 1st, 2014 for that, for that school year.
Okay. So looking forward to it, actually. Yep. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew. Glad to be here, as always. Recently, AB also hosted its annual cabaret night. It is an important fundraiser for the Curtis Department in the high school and is the biggest fundraiser of the year. Matt McCoby has more on the story. Cabaret night took place on November 16th and 17th. It was a night filled with entertainment from numerous talented students. This annual event was a big success. We asked Ms. Moss how the proceeds will benefit her program. So all the money raised from this goes directly back to the students. After we cover costs like custodians and um, costs for decorations, etc., um, the main portion of it goes to our accompanist, um, who's not employed by the school, so that we're able to pay for her and have her here with the students every day. Then we asked Ms. Moss what the main event was. The trapeze was a big hit. That was kind of cool because normally you're not going to see those two girls who are like taking your math and English class and you know that they can do trapeze. Probably a trapeze. At the beginning of Cabaret, Matt Lind and David Nicholson started to sing Fireworks by Katy Perry. Get your heart racing in my skin tight jeans. Be a teenage dream tonight. Oh, I might get your heart racing. Soon after, Rapai and Yogi did his magic trick. Well, that does it for our show. I'm Joe Murphy. And I'm Tyler St. Lawrence. Thanks for watching, everyone.